Hello and welcome back to our seventh episode indeed of Symphony to Coma's Saturday Night Live Facebook chats. You are listening to Trains of Thought and that is by Greg Utes, a wonderful performance by the Auburn Symphony for whom it was written in 2000. We're here with you tonight to talk about creative endeavors and just to explore a little bit of the world of one of the South Sound's great talents. As a composer and many more things, you'll get to know about him a little more tonight. Greg Utes, to many of you, he is a familiar face to Symphony Tacoma as the host of the Symphony Music Mixes. But as many of you know, he's also a very fine composer, the professor of music at um, Pacific Lutheran University, and also the director of the study abroad programs in Ch for China, Trinidad and Tobago, a huge cultural ambassador, a composer influenced by global travel. So let's journey into his world. Please bring on Greg Utes tonight. And if you're watching, please um, let us know you're here, post a comment, share this post, share this evening. I'm really excited about this evening. So send us some big messages. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, <Hi>. everybody. <laughs> and we have the lovely Becky Fresney with you. Hi. A creative Hi. place. It must be in your house. How are you both doing tonight? <laughs> doing very well, thank you. Great, yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> we are so excited to uh, perform your music, Greg, in the future. Tell us a little bit about the inspiration for that piece that we just heard, Trains of Thought. Um, I was doing the pre-concert lectures for the Auburn Symphony back in the late 90s, and the conductor, Stuart Kershaw, uh, discovered I was a composer and asked me to write a piece for him. And uh, the, uh, the commission was from the city of Auburn who requested that it have something to do with Auburn. And I thought, what? What do you write about at the city of Auburn? I, I did a little history, of course, and discovered it used to be called Slaughter, which mm -hmm. sounded dire, so I decided not to touch that. Uh, but you know, the thing which everybody knew about Auburn at the time was that Auburn citizens were very frustrated with the trains because the trains go right through Auburn and they sort of shut off all the traffic. So I decided that in uh, the spirit of John Cage, we, uh, I should write a piece which invites people to really meditate on the sounds of trains. If you're sitting at the crossing waiting for the train, the least you can do is enjoy the sounds. And I live, in fact, right above Titlow Beach. So I hear trains going by something like 125 times a day. And the other thing which a lot of people don't know, actually, is I used to hop freight trains. For like eight years, I covered tens of thousands of miles by freight train uh, just for fun. And I got to know the sounds of the whistles and you know the sounds of the wheels and the brakes and all these things. So when I wrote this piece, I simply went down to Titlow and I just took a sheet of music paper and I notated all the sounds that I heard. And what you just heard was the very opening of the piece, which sort of introduces all of those sounds out of which then the rest of the piece is built. <laughs> Fantastic. And I... I think people can go to your website and listen to the work in its entirety, correct? Indeed. Right. So um, at the moment, you're working on a fantastically exciting piece, which also does have some connection to trains. We were hoping to be able to perform very soon your uh, selections from the Tacoma Method. Please tell, tell us a little bit about writing this piece and what's the inspiration for that? Well, um, Another hat that I wear besides PLU Music Prof and host of the pre-concert mixers for Symphony Tacoma, I'm a board member of the Chinese Reconciliation Project Foundation, 
which is the foundation that's building the Chinese park down on Tacoma's waterfront. Um, a lot of people don't know the park is not done yet. Uh, there's, there's more buildings to come, there's pathways, there's a fish pond, there's all kinds of things yet to be built. So I'm on the board that's busy trying to build that. And I also um, help produce the, the Tacoma Moon Festival every mm -hmm. uh, September. So of course that whole park is, is, is built kind of in commemoration of the uh, tragic expulsion of the Chinese from Tacoma in 1885. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm sort of in a horrified fashion, I suppose, fascinated with that history. And um, uh, I also um, wrote um, another opera uh, just recently. It was performed at PLU in 2016 with um, a librettist who is a poet from Beijing who's been living in this country for many years now. And she and her husband um, are both, in fact, professors at the Evergreen State College. That's her name so is, uh, she is yeah. watching, she's I'm watching the comments go by. She's watching oh, right now. Hello to Zhang Ah. Well, this is this is just one of many books by Zhang Ah. Uh, this is books of her poetry. Um, but she's also written um, uh, helped put together anthologies of Chinese contemporary poetry. Um, many books. These were the two I had at home. But and her husband Leonard Schwartz is also deeply involved in sort of contemporary poetry circles. And both of them are just great lovers of Western opera. And so Zhang Ar herself decided to see what it would be like as a poet to write a libretto. Mm -hmm. And she showed me one of these oh close to ten years ago now. And it was based on on sort of ancient Chinese history. But I was so fascinated that I decided to take a scene and set it to music just to see how it worked. And that turned into a whole opera. And uh, we performed that in 2016. I saw it. It was wonderful. And I absolutely loved the Chinese flautist as well. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> right. So anyway, um, I think I get credit for introducing Zhang Ar to this tragic story of Tacoma history. Mm -hmm. and as a Chinese immigrant herself, um, she was fascinated by this history, which she'd never heard before, and really, really dug into it, read every book on the subject, did all kinds of research, and wrote a second libretto now um, based on what, what is historically known as the Tacoma method, the way that a community can get rid of its Chinese population. So um, it's a kind of a tragic tale, but of course, as we all know, uh, immigration is a constant conversation in the United States. It has been for 400 years. Um, and, you know, it's kind of back. And sometimes it's a positive conversation. Sometimes it's a negative conversation. And so um, I decided to, to, she decided to write a libretto based on this story. And um, so I am busy writing it. And I would say I'm probably an hour and a half into about a two hour opera. And um, we don't have a performance, produ uh, you know, uh, scheduled yet. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get a, a company to schedule a new opera, particularly on a kind of a tough subject like this. Um, so we've been shopping out parts of it. We did some uh, arias at the Tacoma Historical Society big civil rights dinner, which they did what two and a half years ago. Uh, we've done some things at PLU, at Evergreen College, uh, a couple of other places around town. Um, and and um, so then I, I suggested to Sarah that maybe Symphony Tacoma would be interested in getting in on some of this, you know, kind of pre-production performance sometime. And uh, Sarah, in her typical creative way, said, why don't you create a big kind of symphonic excerpt version? Um, and so that's what I've been working on for the last um, three or four months, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of homework with that. I just thought I'd share a couple of documents. People sometimes wonder, what does an opera libretto look like? So this is Zhang Ar's opera libretto for this piece. And you can see that I tend to sort of uh, draw pictures. I, I do little rhythmic sketches. If I turn it over, you can see that I, I, I sort of think about arias in, in sections, in chunks. Sometimes there are words that I circle that make me say, aha, that's an important word. I better pay attention to that. Um, then I go into the business of, of actually designing what I think of as the language of the piece. I don't know how well you can see that, but I'm literally inventing harmony in sketches like this. And so these things don't mean much to anybody but me, but they're critical to me. Um, 
that's amazing. And I think that at this time, we're going to find that this opera is more meaningful than ever before when it gets to be performed because of the nature of what's going on between, even right now, discussions between the leaders of China and the USA. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the important thing is that your music will reconnect us. And, and one of the reasons I, I really am, am inspired by what you write is because you write this opera from the perspective of both sides, and then you integrate the music um, in an extraordinarily clever way, I have to say. So um, are you gonna play us just a little excerpt from it? And yeah, tell us what uh, we're gonna play, we're gonna play uh, short snippets of two different arias. The first one is by the Chinese heroine. She, her name is Mrs. May in the libretto, but she is a historical character. Her husband, Lum May, was one of the rich Chinese merchants here in Tacoma, owned a store, um, and his wife had a household with two kids. This is, this is historical fact. Um, and so she, at this point in the opera, is singing to a friend of hers saying, oh, don't worry, everything's gonna be okay because this is America. And then the second little snippet, which we'll go right into, is by another uh, historical character, this one well known to everybody in the Puget Sound area, and this is Ezra Meeker. Ezra Meeker, of course, is the founder of the city of Puyallup. He was known at the time as the hop king, the king of hop growing, right? The beer, beer ingredient. And it made him one of the richest men in Washington in the late 19th century. So uh, he famously stood up in front of a crowd of Tacoma people and said, you should not expel these Chinese people. So he goes down in history as a good guy. So we'll hear these two little snippets, sort of a, a Chinese person trying to reassure herself and Ezra Meeker kind of wagging his finger at the crowd.
Thank you, Greg. And I do want to remind everybody that what they heard was not Symphony Tacoma, but your computer in a, in a rendition of, uh, well, not real sounds, but electronic sounds, and it will sound remarkably different when we perform it. Indeed, you know, in, in the 1980s, composers went from medieval monks, I literally used to dip my quill pen in a bottle of ink and draw every note. And then sometime in the 80s, you know, we, we never had musical typewriters that any individual person could use. I mean, it was all hand done until finally, we, suddenly we leapt into the computer age. And so now uh, people use computers at different stages in the process. Sometimes I compose directly on the computer. Sometimes I use those kinds of sketches and then just sort of, you know, put it into the computer. Sometimes I go back and forth. But anyway, at some point I can now press play and my computer renders what you heard. That allows me to sort of check things and hear things go by in a sweep and 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 hear, you know, more or less mock-ups of real instrumental sound. Right. So are there any significance? In the 16th notes, that's a question that came in from somebody is mm. in Tacoma. Yeah. In the percussion part, tell us if there was any significance with those repeated sections. Sure. Uh, the percussion, the second percussionist at that point is playing some wood blocks. And um, the, the fun I have in, in this opera, and in fact, in the previous opera too, is using Western instruments to emulate the sound of Chinese instruments. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's a very uh, classic Chinese sound, both in instrumental, um, like ensemble music, but also in Chinese opera, to hear this sort of ticky ticky tick uh, kind of sound. And so I have the, the second um, uh, percussionist playing actually a series of three wood blocks so that they can play low, medium, or high. And what you heard is this sort of ticky ticky tick on the high wood block. It's fantastic. Now, we have with you also an incredibly creative person, Becky. Um, we have so much enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to see some of your works with the Symphony Galas. Um, but I had the opportunity to get to know and explore your work a bit more recently. And we've decided to share them because we think they're so wonderful. I know that you're very well known in this region, but, but just for our audience here, um, Tell us a little bit as we watch these images on the screen about them flash up and the connection is obviously so strongly linked to music. And I think if I were a painter, I'd be definitely, I'd be somewhere in your landscape doing something similar. It's okay. really wonderful. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure what's gonna show up on the yeah. screen, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, Greg's composing every day and I'm painting here at home in my studio. So um, this is kind of an over the top. Um, I've been painting a, a lot about the weather in spring because we see um, a lot of weather from our perch uh, looking west from Tacoma. And oh, there's some music here. So I think I'll be quiet, just look. This is a suggest chimes or little triangles, little bits of sound. These are tone poems. Um, they call them tone poems. And this one's about a, a low tide in the summer. This one was about a nocturne. Um, I see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. There you go. Little snippet. <laughs> yeah. I see Kristen Nielsen there from Chicago. She was one of my students at POU years ago. I keep reading the side bit here. I, I can't reach the, t the keyboard, so I can't answer. <laughs> What's really fun for me is that I can go out in Becky's garage studio and um, sort of check in on these things as, as they're developing. Um, I'll go out one day, and she, she's very fond of, of putting what, what musicians would call a five-line staff across the painting numerous times and then beginning to cover it with paint and um she's she's been working on this series uh 
I don't know, probably 10, 12 years now called learning to read music <laughs> because she does not read music. So to her, what I look at all the time is black dots. And but but in her hands, they become these wonderful sort of creative um, meditations on the shapes of notes. And recently you've been what, taking apart musical instruments and and making kind of constructions out of them, which are sometimes mm -hmm. part of paintings or mm -hmm. sometimes sculptural objects. Right, right, right. <laughs> People keep giving them to me, so I keep doing something with them. Artwork so our audience can go check it out. But please tell us, when is your next exhibition going to be when can we see that um i think the two main things i have coming up are um i'm going to put up an installation of pieces um on ninth street it's there's a series of windows that are inset along ninth street and along the pentages so i'm designing a new one called ninth street orchestra for that window and then fiddlewoods which i did in auburn last winter will be around the corner on commerce street commerce street it's called fiddlewoods it's a blue forest playing violins. <laughs> and then I'm going to, I'm preparing the tone poems for uh, an exhibition at Green River Community College a year. I think it's a year from September, so it's a ways off. I'll let you know about that. That's wonderful. I can't wait to see those. Do you, do you get inspired by Greg's mu music and he gets inspired by your artworks? Does, is it a kind of a synergy <laughs> from place Maybe. to place? <laughs> well, I, I, um, I mostly um, ask Greg for input, for feedback, or, or just an understanding of a particular, usually a particular musical form, because I'm not a musician, so I don't understand the vocabulary. I've learned over time listening to Greg talk about music and listen to his music, and I love his music. It's always, it's always got a lot of, for me, narrative um, elements, I guess. Um, evocative elements that I can that I can borrow. Yeah. yeah. So there's question. somebody would love to know: Is your artwork for sale? Um, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Check it out on the website, right? Yeah, generally yes. Yeah. Um, and and uh, but I, I don't um, I don't make them specifically to sell them. I. I just make them to go to see what I can do and challenge myself. So every once in a while I have an exhibit and then they're for sale. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. that your works have been exhibited in, in studios in Seattle as well. Is that, yeah. Which right. studio would that be? Well, um, I used to belong to a cooperative gallery called Gallery 110. And, um, and every once in a while I loan some pieces to um, an, um, a senior living community called ERA Living. Mm -hmm. and the curator for that organization um, borrows my work for three or four months and puts it up in these beautiful, beautiful residential buildings. And it's really nice to see them there and people can enjoy them within their own living space for a while. So I I really like doing things that are in community, like community <clears throat> college galleries and non-commercial spaces where a lot of people from the general public will will be able to to see the work and see it for some time over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, one of the things we both enjoy kind of the multimedia sort of crossing over normal boundaries between painting and sculpture or for me between between music and theater and you know sarah i was going to say that that we've noticed that you have the same tendency uh ever since you came to symphony tacoma we've been enjoying a lot of kind of multimedia pieces and um i was going to get you to talk just a little bit about your background in art visual art mm -hmm. uh, i know your kids are involved sometimes um wh where do you get your kind of interest in in mixing the arts well good question i i come from um quite an artistic family as you know my, my father's a composer um my grandfather was an architect and his sense of structure and the way that buildings has always been a, very appealing but he also had a sense of creativity about um, designing platforms where artists and musicians would meet. He was one of the finalists in the Prix de Rome in, I think it was 1918, 
Um, and also my mother and my, my aunt are both wonderful um, painters. They would say they, they do it for also for fun, but I've always green, been such an admirer of artists. My daughter paints and draws, they're all quite creative. I consider myself actually the least creative, uh, mm-hmm. but I love to connect people and I love to curate and I love to um, connect different segments. I, I think partly the most creative part of my my role is um, connecting people and different, collaborating with different organizations. I One of the first pieces that we did was with Evelyn Glennie. Um, I think we're gonna show you a couple of pictures of some of the projects that we've done. Maybe, in fact, some people, if you have some favorite collaborations or things that you remember doing, perhaps you could post them and, and share them for, us in our comments. It's, it's always nice to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane. I'm always going forward. Um, somebody said, we, you saw some of my pictures. Well, actually, I I do have dabbled in painting a little bit. Um, and some of those pictures did appear in a multimedia that we created for you called Saxophone Fusion that went along with Creation du Monde. Um, and yeah, you might you might see some more in the future. Who who knows? I mean, I I want to be uh, able to share with you some of my creative spirit, but I tend to do it through programming and through ideas. In fact, I think we have a video for you of Fire Mountain. And if Susan is behind the scenes as our producer, maybe you could share some memories for us now. This is Fire Mountain, which was written by Dan Ott and was a wonderful collaboration with um, Hilltop Glass Artists, also uh, the Glass Museum. And we also took a trip up the mountain with Greg um, and the composer Dan Ott, who was a student of Greg's. Uh, This is a very exciting project. So I'll, I'll let you watch this little clip we've prepared for you.
That was Fire Mountain by Daniel Ott and the imagery was a film that was created with footage from, um, thanks to the, the Parks Association. This was written to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Parks Association. And Derek Klein did the imagery for the, the putting together the wonderful film that you saw. And here we have some pictures, some memories of us. Um, that was my inaugural concert we have with Evelyn Glennie and Sean O'Boyle was the creator of that incredible project. And then we, we've done some fun things like Water Passion by uh, Tandun, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Um, there, there is a picture of Greg and Dan up the mountain with some of our wonderful students from Lincoln High School. And that's us in our creator studio working on the video and a bit of the rehearsal with the final product and a wonderful um, mention in the Symphony League. It's wonderful to have such fabulous partners. I don't think I could do any of this curating without such an incredible team. Everybody from the board to the staff, to the orchestra musicians, the composer, all really working together. And that, that's what it takes to put together these creative endeavors. And um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, Becky and Greg, people have been loving your presentation. I wanna thank everybody for watching. I know that we have a question. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna read them out in whatever order they come. Um, can you also make sure to answer the question we received? Oh, which one? It's hard to see them all, but I do see one that asks if I ever compose. Well, I have composed in the past, most particularly when I was at Juilliard. I think back to Oxford, we had to write fugues. Uh, we were given the head motif and then we had to create the rest of it, the entire exposition. We had to orchestrate pieces in the style of Debussy or Elgar and we had a lot of fun with that. Occasionally I wrote a piece. In fact, I took a took a class in electronic music at Juilliard and I think had a lot of fun writing a piece. But it's been it's been a long time since I've actually written a piece. I'm I'm in awe of anybody who creates anything extraordinary. So I'm not in that category. I'm just enjoying sharing the great music. Um, Sven, Ronning, you're watching our wonderful concert master. Thank you for doing the broadcast a while ago. Um, says that you're passionate and interesting and thanks for guiding us with your artistic, through our, your artistic lives. Um, are your painting influencing your artistic direction, Sarah? Um, yes, um, I think in a way my paintings are influencing, influenced by uh, my extraordinary um, individual, like everybody, unique lifestyle. So I might uh, write a story of something rather quiet, rather more intimate or, or private. I, th I think that's what the creator does artistically is, is share those deep inner messages that you can't really write. And I think that's something that's so special about being an artist or a, a, a conductor, or oh, sorry, composer. <laughs> well, we have another question. If, uh, if the quarantine goes on, will we see more of your paintings? <laughs> oh, I hope so. I can. I'll show you paintings anytime they ask for them. <laughs> I, I will say, you know, uh, we we of course recognize our huge privilege. We still have a salary coming in. I'm still teaching online every day. Quite busy in front of my Zoom meetings and and composition lessons. Becky does um, lessons with adult painters mm -hmm. uh, three three days a week, and those have moved online uh, via Zoom or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, it, it is it is also true that probably all of us who are makers and creators, and I'm sure this is true for Sarah, too, um, we are basically quite internal people. We can go deep inside and just happily stay there for a very long time. <laughs> and in some ways, I mean, this is a, a time when the whole world has kind of gone inside. And in some ways, we just... Um, it, it's 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 actually a very conducive time to to just make a lot of stuff. Um, do you feel, I'm, 
everybody we else. Have a question from Dick Ammerman. I just want to get it in because we've got so many coming in. Um, will you write an opera about COVID-19? Thank you, Dick, for the question. Thanks, Dick, for asking. Just today, I started my next composition project, which is a series of songs based on uh, poems by Tacoma's former poet laureate, Josie Emmons Turner. She's writing a series of poems this spring about COVID-19. And so I'm gonna set four or five of her poems um, for a couple of singers and a pianist. And I'll make sure that everybody knows when those are going to be performed. Fantastic. Uh, we also we also have a question from Jim Short. Thank you for sending your questions. We, lo we love them. Question for you, Greg. What type of ensemble have you always wanted to write for, but have not yet had the opportunity? I, I've written for just about every Western ensemble there is, from opera and musical theater to chamber music and orchestra and band and choir and sort of everything. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I would love to do that I have not yet been able to do is a ballet. Mm -hmm. So if anybody out there is a ballet master, call me up. Karen, where's Karen? Let's send this to her. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, what an extraordinary creative world you both live in in your household. Uh, so wonderful. I'm, I'm just thrilled to have you join us for this conversation. Um, thank you for I also time. want to thank you, Greg, for all you do for Symphony Tacoma behind the scenes. It's really uh, wonderful that you lead our music mixes, that you, you're actually a guiding spirit of creativity to me. Um, we, we've got this kind of Google document that we've been working on for, well, gosh, it's nearly four or five years now. Um, we've actually managed to do some of those fun projects like bring a tabla play on and, you know, who knows what we'll, what we'll come up with next. Well, I, I, I'm just, I just want to say that I'm so appreciative, Sarah, of your imaginative spirit. I mean, I love symphony orchestra concerts and I could listen to Brahms all day long, but I also know that the symphony orchestra needs to live in the modern world as well. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people think of classical music as kind of like a museum. It's going to the going to the Louvre and seeing the Mona Lisa, which, which is fine. We all love the Mona Lisa and we all love Brahms. But there's also the side of the art world, which is the gallery scene, right? Which is people making stuff now. That's Becky's world. Right. And, and, and classical music and painting, they have things to say about our modern world, whether it's COVID-19 or the Tacoma method or, or anything. And so um, I really appreciate your, your very fresh contemporary mm -hmm. spirit. And, and I was going to say before we uh, let you go, I, I know that your father is a composer. And I, one of the things we put on our Greg and Sarah's schemes uh, Google Drive was maybe having your father uh, come and, and have you perform some of his music sometime, which I think would be fabulous. So I, I wondered if, if you could tell us just a hair about your father's music. Sure. I, I'll do that in a moment. And I do just want to respond to you um, about Fire Mountain again, because it's kind of close to my heart um, that when we talk about living in the here and now, the opportunity to share the message of the world and uh, the beauty of this area, Mount Rainier, and the the effects of global warming upon our world is really um, an important subject that we cannot underestimate, I think, its importance. So um, I feel that music can do two things. It can look ahead, it can point ahead to the future, it can, well, three things, express where we are right now and, and look back. And so I would love to share a piece that my father has written. Uh, it's called Reminiscences. And he he's written it for my half-brother, Lucas Benno, who is the principal trumpet of Leipzig Gewandhaus. And um, hmm. it's with his brass quintet, which is the Gavantas quintet that he's performed it and recorded it. Hmm. Uh, my father's writing his memoirs right now. And um, I'm just so thrilled to learn and read what he has said. And one of the things we recently found out was um, about the family that we initially came from, which was the. Um, 
the Nani family of Maltese musicians that goes back to 1759 with the first musician um, who was composer mm. also. So yeah. composing is very close to my heart and I'm, I'm really proud of my dad's work and also of my brother as a uh, half, half brother as a um, musician. And I think I'll let this piece speak for itself. You'll hear a snippet of it and we'll put a link also to where you can download the, the complete rendition if you'd like to. Um, but maybe one day I will have the opportunity to bring my father back and perform one of his pieces. It's always very, very hard, you know, because one doesn't want to overly promote the talents of your own family, right? <laughs> but I think he's a very good composer, and I think the world of Lucas as well. And uh, he's been a great inspiration and to me throughout my life, also uh, becoming a conductor. And so oh. this is a this is a thanks thanks dad moment oh, and uh, thank you to all those creative spirits and those who've um, inspired me on our way thank you both so much for joining us and and we'll end with this little snippet of reminiscences and if you haven't had your question answered we will check back with you and post our comments later in the next day or so so thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, please share this. It'll be on YouTube later um, with our Symphony Tacoma channel. In, in fact, if you haven't subscribed to Symphony Tacoma's YouTube channel, this is an opportunity to go there and watch the previous episodes. They've I've had such wonderful guests. Everybody has been fascinating to talk to. And uh, thank you guys out there for watching and uh, commenting and sharing this and being a wonderful uh, I'd say backstage audience. Is that the right word? Virtual audience. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks for having us, Sarah. Good night. It's been great. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. This is reminiscences. Thank you.